This is phase two of our biome experiment, the episode that everyone's been waiting for. In phase two, we intentionally dose a slurry of algae, chrysophytes, diatoms, dinos, and cyano to these tanks, not once, but twice. Can these 12 experiment takes fend off the uglies, or are they doomed? This is Beerus TV Investigates the Biome Cycle, and we're going to find out. All these tanks have now been cycling for 15 weeks, 10 of which was illuminated, to see what type of photosynthetic pests show up. That was phase one, and some look better than others. The sterile approach is doing better than you might anticipate. In fact, maybe the cleanest looking tanks. The most diverse or most live approaches looking the ugliest with the most pests. This seems to demonstrate the value of efforts to reduce or eliminate pest introduction during the first most vulnerable months of a tank. However, in phase two, we even the playing field. Every tank is going to have a variety of pests introduced eventually, and they're not sterile. How will 12 of these different approaches deal with the inevitable uglies that hitchhike into our tanks via coral, fish, and invert additions? The ugly slurry is made up of sucking out the worst of the worst from each experiment tank, mixing it all together, and then we dose that ugly slurry to each tank, and then we repeated the process to nearly ensure the introduction of cyano, dinos, diatoms, green algae, and chrysophytes to each tank, likely multiple forms of each. We watch these tanks for another 10 weeks under intense SPS lighting to see what emerges and how long it lasts. To set the expectations, I anticipate none of these tanks are going to look perfect after dosing all of these pests to them. What we're looking for is which of the pests show up. Do they rapidly solve themselves, indicating they find balance with other organisms, or does the pest become an ongoing problem or explosion that requires human intervention? Going into this, my suspicion was the bacterial or balanced biofilm will be helpful in combating the spread of cyanobacteria or red slime as well as dinos, simply because promoting a healthy biome and dosing bacteria has been a successful solution for so many. Presumably, we can use an ounce of prevention here to avoid outbreaks and need for the pounds of cure. Microcrustaceans like pods and micro snails will be helpful at keeping diatoms and green algae at bay, simply because every source I've found tells me pods eat a lot of diatoms, and we know most of them are microscopic grazers of algae. Again, presumably, that ounce of prevention. Chrysophytes a bit more of a mystery. The most common filamentous forms are outcompeted by nearly anything, and they tend to be avoided completely with some of the more balanced approaches to the overall biome. Time to find out if all of this holds true. Starting with the one tank that defines this test, the two cups of sand from Steve's established tank. This tank looks great and stable for many years and generally just looks clean. However, there's something hidden in that sand that we exported to this experiment. When we took its sand, they would later infect all of the experiment tanks. It's explosive orange diatoms. In week 15, we left this tank covered in orange film. Everyone who saw it thought it was diatoms. We sent in a sample to the aquabiomics team who DNA confirmed the diatoms in the correct genus. And we confirmed that under a microscope as well. A nasty form of diatom is indeed what we imported from Steve's tank to the experiment tank and many of the other tanks via our pest slurry. The orange diatom is by far the most aggressive pest that we ran into. It's important to note that this type of explosive diatom does not poof into existence out of thin air. It's an organism that had to be introduced to your tank via something you put in it. In fact, this is the only tank of 12 that had a visual problem with diatoms prior to the slurry, which gets to the heart of why a dozen reefers might try to cycle a tank in very similar ways and have 12 different results. Many of them have just not introduced the more aggressive organisms, or they may do it down the line when the tank is better prepared. In a tank like Steve's, it wouldn't matter because something in that tank is keeping the diatoms in check. However, just like Steve's tank where we can't seem to see them, it's likely that some of the other 12 tanks do have these diatoms, they're just not presenting themselves as a problem because something is keeping them at bay as well. Presumably a predator that eats them. In fact, I know that to be the case because I found these diatoms in some of the best performing tanks via microscope, but these tanks are looking solid visually. In that spirit, it's now time to follow the experiment tank that had two cups of Steve's sand post double dose of the ugly slurry. We move from week 15 where the slurry was dosed to week 16. We see the problem only gets worse. The diatoms are now out competing the chrysophytes. But notice one thing, week 16, the first time that we see signs of microcrustaceans growing on the back of the tank. One of two things likely happened here. It could be the micros were dosed as part of the slurry, but that didn't happen in the other tanks. I believe the pods and the micros that we're seeing now were likely introduced with the sand from Steve's tank. In fact, the same predators that were probably keeping the diatoms at bay in Steve's tank were imported with that sand, but they just started emerging rapidly when an increasingly large food source showed up. Likely the reason that we see all the diatoms explode first is simply because the diatoms can replicate a lot faster than the predatory pods. 
But the good news is copepods are hungry. Remember how the Monterey Bay Aquarium site shares a single copepod can eat up to 370,000 diatoms a day? There's an unfathomable amount of food for these pods here, and the pods will likely win out in the end. It'll just take longer than we might like to find that equilibrium. Week 17, I cleared a small area of sand to see how fast they'd come back, and it was not as fast as they arrived. The diatoms are holding ground, but something is now slowing them down. What took days to populate now takes weeks. Week 18, a bit worse. 19, spreading again, but still more signs of microcrustaceans. Week 20 is ugly, but there's an important change. Rather than slime, it looks like a broken down sludge and lighter, thinner coating. Week 21, we did our best to manually clean it all off. This time, the orange diatoms do not come back. Two weeks later, 23, it's still comparatively clean. Two weeks after that, the diatoms seem to be an issue of the past, but now the chrysophytes reemerge and signs of cyano are back in this tank. This is pretty common where when one problem is solved, another emerges. Regardless of how the diatoms are beat in any of these experiment tanks, it's followed with cyano and chrysophytes in more than half of them. Solving one problem, opening space for the next, or a game of whack the ugly. Ultimately, I would not seed a microbiome with sand from an established tank again. The reason is all that sand was in a well-lit area of Steve's tank. The result is we added a very undesirable, seemingly virulent photosynthetic pest with these diatoms at our tank's most vulnerable point when the tank is brand new. Success very closely related to what happens to be in that sand, this method not particularly reliable. However, something does beat these diatoms in the end. There's lots of potential answers, but the one that I believe the most is an established pod or microcrustacean population from Steve's tank eventually won the microscopic war against the diatoms. In phase three, we're gonna put all that theory to the test by dosing LG Barnes ecopods to all of these tanks. Next tank, a contrast to that. How does the control of dry rock, dry sand, or a more sterile approach perform? This tank finished week 15 with the best eDNA biome score from Aquabiomics, and visually just some signs of weak filamentous chrysophytes. However, it's never encountered or had to battle most of the uglies. I'm sure a lot of us have questions about how well it will hold up against the ugly slurry. Week 16, what we believe to be chrysophytes take off, very likely unrelated to the pest introduction. This could be just unhealthy hair algae, but the golden brown color, short filaments, and how it emerged on multiple surfaces all over the tank all at once leads me to believe filamentous chrysophytes. Week 17, they get thicker and more pronounced, and the tank now has no signs of microcrustaceans in the tank. Week 18, a subtle orange tint shows up on most of the surfaces in the tank. This is those diatoms from the ugly slurry. Watch how fast they take over and relentless they are. Week 19, they cover the entire tank. Week 20, a dark, overwhelming infestation that appears to be choking out the chrysophytes. Week 21, we clean the tank the best we can and hope for the best. Two weeks later, the diatoms are back with a vengeance. However, notice the chrysophytes are gone. This is the great microbial or microscopic war that's happening in the tank. The strongest forces, best equipped to use the available resources, will win. Clean the tank, sometimes a solution, other times just resetting the battlefield. Week 25, the tank looks terrible. These diatoms have lasted two months now and showing no signs of relenting. Many potential explanations for this, but I believe the most plausible is we failed to introduce a natural diatom predator to this tank. However, before we count the sterile dry rock and dry sand approaches out, remember, this tank ended the initial 15 weeks with the best microbiome balance score of the 12 tanks. Looks amongst the best at that point as well. And while this approach to biome cycling was unable to beat the forms of chrysophytes and diatoms, we didn't see green algae, dinos, or cyano in this tank. We can't help but wonder what would happen to this approach if we had that addition of a diatom predator, potentially pods. We'll find that out in phase three by dosing pods this tank. Will a pound of cure with a ton of pods eliminate the diatoms? If so, how long will it take? We will find out. Next tank, the Gulf Rock tank. Most of the reefing community would believe that this is the most natural biome donor. It's the most diverse as tested by Aquabiomics and would be amongst the best at fending off the ugly slurry. Like the Indo Rock, this tank did not need any more problems at week 15, but unlike the Indo Rock, it has a very different outcome. Week 15, covered in hair algae and cyano, we then dose the slurry of all five pests to this. Week 16, the rock and sand up front actually get a bit cleaner post ugly slurry. Week 17 and 18, similar increases in algae reduction as well as cyano reduction. Notice, no signs of orange diatoms because they never show up in this tank. Week 19, cyano is almost gone, and other than the back of the tank, the hair algae is disappearing, a major improvement that continues into week 20. This tank is solving some of its own issues.
Week 21 in this tank is now the best looking tank here, dream type rock. Week 23, the cyano is now gone, but the hair algae is relentless. And we finished week 25 with a green algae issue, but beat or prevented the four other uglies in the slurry. However, while this approach to biome cycling a tank didn't end up perfect, I think it's an example of biome redundancy working. The microbiome from a wet live rock, a winner. The fact that it came directly from the Gulf and shipped here submerged in seawater resulted in a more robust microcrustacean population than you'd get with newspaper wrapped moist live rock from the other side of the world. The microscopic predators are keeping many of the pests or uglies at bay. I don't see any major signs of cyano, dinos, chrysophytes, or even the orange diatoms. And I know they're all in there because we dosed them to the tank twice. There are only four tanks that avoid the diatom issues, and this is one of them. The only pest that's thriving in this tank is green algae, and it's likely the meso predators of snails, crabs, or urchins, and macro predators of utilitarian fish and tang gang could have kept the tank looking like week 21 perpetually. Together, that redundant biome is what we're looking for. Micro, meso, and macro predators forming layers of biome redundancy. There's a lot to like here with the Gulf Rock. It would likely even be a better journey if we had dark cured the rock before using it and a more aggressive approach to nutrient control, but there is one caveat. This was a long journey to week 21, and a lot of it was pretty darn ugly, and the wet Gulf Rock shipped in water is the most expensive solution that we tried here. There are solutions that you'll see today that may not look like this live, but are cheaper, look cleaner, and have fewer hurdles. One of those is the next tank, the Marine Pure brick from an established tank. Not perfect, but also has a lot to be learned here. The expectation here is that porous Marine Pure brick will have transported a healthy biome from the established tank that it was in, and because that tank didn't have any pest issues, this one won't either. Let's see. Picking up where we left off in week 15, some green algae growing in the tank and not much else, notably lots of microcrustaceans. This is what we dosed the ugly slurry to. Week 16, the sand starts to clean up and the algae in the brick is visibly breaking down. Week 17, algae breaking down further. This continues through week 18, but the matted biome film in the sand on the right is getting thicker. However, by week 19, the mat is getting thinner and notice no orange diatom explosion because it never happens in this tank. What was in the 900 is protecting this tank from diatoms. In week 20, what's left on the brick is weak. Sand is getting cleaner. Week 21, we cleaned the tank, and all that decaying algae just blew off and left nice and clean surfaces. Week 23 stays clean, other than some rogue pieces of Catomorpha. Week 25, the rock has developed a green tint, but the tank stays free of the five major uglies. In this case, one of the most obvious signs of visual microcrustaceans, copepods, amphipods, two worms, snails, and limpets. So this tank doesn't look perfect. The biome in this tank successfully defended against cyano, diatoms, dinos, and chrysophytes dosed with the ugly slurry. Struggled a bit with green algae, but even beat most of the green algae without a single crab, snail, or fish. This again is what I mean when I say a redundant baseline layer of biome redundancy where the typical cleanup crew and herbivorous fish are the final polish rather than a frontline defense. I have two big questions. Did the pest slurry actually help with the algae? The algae in both this tank and the wet golf rock was thriving until we added the slurry. Post slurry is when the green algae started to dissipate. So are some of what we would consider pests, maybe really part of the tank's microscopic cleanup crew, that are only pests or uglies when they fall out of balance with the other organisms in the tank? Second, what if we had actually cut this brick down and put it into the sump area rather than the display? Could we have avoided some of the photosynthetic bumps along the way, and maybe even some of the other pests like the aptasia or bubble algae in the tank? We have another tank that we'll get to in a moment that does something very similar to that. But first, the Indonesian wet live rock, another one we'd assume would do really well, but didn't in phase one. Considering where we left it off in week 15, it's clear this tank has enough problems and didn't need any more. But we dose the ugly slurry and watch how a bad tank can actually get worse when it's unprepared for new pests. Week 16 looks more or less the same, but in week 17 you start to see something new emerge, all those dark brown specks in the sand, and week 18 become a dark mat that takes over the sand bed, and week 19, remember those explosive orange diatoms from the two cups of sand from Steve's tank? Well, the pest slurry had them, and you can now see that orange tint showing up here. Week 20, the tank is destroyed with orange diatoms are now clearly competing with the bubble form of chrysophytes for surface area and resources. Week 21, we clean the tank, which is hard with something this far gone, but week 23, the diatoms come right back. By week 25, the diatoms do seem to be scaling back, but this tank is battling nearly everything. Algae, diatoms, chrysophytes, and what appears to be cyano and a biological mat growing all over the sand. 
This paper wet live rock set it and forget it approach just didn't work. This experience does seem to challenge the theory or the importance of microcrustaceans and avoiding these pests because it is live rock and going back to week 12 you can see there's a healthy population. But these are just visual cues. It isn't measuring the specific types of pods that made it through the paper wet transport. My suspicion is a type of microcrustaceans that make it through this damp transport is just different than the ones that make it through being submerged in water. It's more likely that damp is going to result in snails and uh, spirobid worms than it would on amphipods or copepods. So even though we do see those signs of microcrustaceans, some of these organisms are going to prey on different organisms or be more efficient at it. However, I believe the answer to why this tank is having so many challenges is there are a ton of things going wrong with it all simultaneously. Initial diversity, more of a challenge than a solution. This is a microscopic war, and we can influence the result, but not dictate it. Some methods a lot better or more predictable than others. Wet live rock from the ocean can come with basically anything on it, and likely the most unpredictable. If we had implemented a dark curing process at the beginning, it would decrease the overall photosynthetic diversity and likely increase the predictability. There's also something to note as we look at the slideshow from week 15, which is the peak of microcrustaceans on the back of the tank, we watch something interesting happen. The crustaceans start to disappear, and there's an inverse relationship with the uglies, which strengthen as the crustaceans dwindle, all the way up to week 18, where the micros are basically gone from the back of the tank, and right after that, the diatoms show up. There seems to be a consistent relationship between many of the desirable and pest organisms in the tank. When one thrives, the other doesn't. When one loses, the other wins. Why that happens or the direct cause is likely a result of a wealth of environmental inputs and be very different each time it happens for each reefer and tank. However, there's some clearly defined trends that you see with all 12 of these tanks that can influence the result. Next up, the ocean direct sand. The DNA test results support the claims of importing the microbiome of the sea with the sand and in just four weeks, ranking the fourth best microbiome. A stark difference from the DNA results of the control. At week 15, the Ocean Direct tank still looks pristine, stand, rocks, glass, the entire tank. The Ocean Direct method is something I would call quasi-sterile. It introduces some of the biome of the sea in the sand, but it is somewhat photosynthetically sterile because the sand has been stored in a dark box for months. However, this approach does not introduce microcrustaceans. The question is, is a healthy microbiome alone enough to fend off all five pests, or will the absence of microcrustaceans tell us a different story? Week 16, you can see a big strand of green algae made it into the tank. Week 17, what looks like chrysophytes start to show up, which gets worse in week 18. However, no signs of slimes, cyano or dinos. But week 19, there's the familiar orange tint, and by week 20, it's taken over the tank. Week 21, we clean it up pretty good, but it doesn't last long, and by week 23, it's back with a vengeance, and a purple slime shows up too. The purple looks a lot like coralline, but isn't. By week 25, this tank is destroyed with purple slime, which I believe may be dinos and orange diatoms. This tank was not ready to deal with the introduction of these specific pests. However, green algae and chrysophytes, a thing of the past. At first glance, this doesn't look good. However, I believe there are a couple of things happening here. One, without a natural predator present in the tank, like copepods or similar organisms, diatoms seem to outcompete nearly everything for resources and territory, something that we see in week 20 that slime choking out nearly everything. When we clean all the surfaces in week 21, we essentially reset the table. Even if there was a healthy balanced microbiome in the rock before, it's likely not that way after these explosions and why when we clean it off, it becomes the wild west on the surface of this rock. This time the purple slime winning a portion of the battlefield. I can't help but wonder how the Ocean Direct would perform against the other four uglies if we found a solution to the diatoms first, which we will. Next up, the aquaforest, biofill, media, and the life source reef mud. This approach resulted in a very similar microbiome makeup as the Ocean Direct, a somewhat surprising connection, but they're both natural ocean substrates that have been essentially dark here in a bag. But will the life source mud deal with the pests in the same way that the Ocean Direct did? Week 15 looks pretty good. After four months, no major signs of diatom, cyano, green algae, dinos, or chrysophytes, a lot better than most. But I do think some of the mud that we're dosing weekly is sticking to the other biofilms in the tank, which you can see in a few areas. We dose the ugly slurry at this point. After the fact, I guess I'm not surprised, but it finds basically the same journey as the ocean direct sand. Week 16 looks pretty good, week 17 as well, but by week 18 we see what I believe to be chrysophytes showing up. Week 19 the rock becomes uh, what looks like dusty or muddy. I believe this is actually the orange diatom showing up, but you can't see it because the life source mud is sticking to it. 
Week 20, you can definitely see the orange diatoms now. Week 21, we clean the tank thoroughly and it looks sharp again. But by week 23, the diatoms have won the day. By week 25, honestly, it looks like a mix of mud, cyano, and diatoms. Now, this is the first time I've ever dosed mud to the tank before, certainly weekly. After this experiment, I'm not a big fan of weekly dosing mud to the tank. However, admittedly, this tank does not have the same filtration, flow, filter socks, and skimmer that a lot of tanks would have in the real world, so the results may not be the same as this. However, I am actually excited about the potential of the life source mud used in different ways. It's undeniable that it produced a very similar microbiome as the ocean direct sand. However, the ocean direct sand only comes in unsifted mixed grade sand that blows around fairly easily. This is the obvious question. What would happen if we took dry special grade sand and mixed some mud into the start of the tank? Would it create a low cost similar but more flexible option? Can we put this mud in a remote fuge? Can we soak the rock in the life source mud for a few weeks as a biome source prior to putting it in the tank and start the microbiome cycled rock? The ocean direct and life source, not likely to be the only solution to all five of the uglies, but can they be a layered component to an overall approach to biome redundancy? Next up, a favorite solution of many, using coral as a microbiome starter. I've done this successfully in a slew of LPS tanks, but never SPS, and always coupled with a bacteria in a bottle and a very intentional approach to cleanup crew but this tank has none of that. We're about to find out if the microbiome from the corals can fend off pests in the slurry. But the story actually ends up being more about a different source of pests and a discussion of if they're really all bad. Week 15 looks pretty good, fairly clean in a healthy microcrustacean population. However, there's some purple slime forming up top, but it looks like cyano to most of us. And if you look at the bottom of the tank, all the red spots are those red flatworms known as planaria that came with the coral. These are going to be a big problem down the road. At this point, we dose the ugly slurry to the tank. Week 16, the cyano is darkening and spreading. I'm fairly certain it originated on the base of the Xenia rock. This continues into week 17 and week 18. I want you to notice how bad the planaria problem has become. All those red dots, which could be mistaken for chloraline or cyano, are really actually small flatworms infesting the rock. In week 19, the tank gets that familiar orange diatom tint, but rather than exploding like the rest of the tanks, it just forms a thin layer in the tank. The red flatworms and cyano, pretty good coverage as well. Week 21, we clean the tank and the cyano is gone, but not the flatworms. I'll say this rock has a darker underlying look, which is common to more fully established tanks. But in week 23, the cyano comes right back. Week 25, the diatoms reemerge as well. Diatoms, however, not flourishing in the same degree as they do in other tanks. This is a good time to point out that this tank is running LPS light in that 75 to 150 range because of the corals in it. The rest of these tanks are pushing SPS par in the 200 to 350 range. That means the diatoms are receiving one third to half the energy in this tank and should spread up to 70% slower. I think it's fair to say that if we crank the lights up, things would go south in this tank fast. This is also the only tank where the diatoms are confined to the sand and do not populate the rocks. Something the rocks is likely a diatom predator. There's a lot to be gleaned from this tank. First, the tank is far from the worst looking tank, but also not the best. It did successfully defend against algae, chrysophytes, and dinos from the slurry, but not cyano or diatoms. Why is that? I believe it's tied to the flatworms. Without them, this tank may have had a different trajectory. I believe this may be an example of why things go poorly when any one organism is allowed to win unchecked. In this case, flatworms. Flatworms are thought to be a predator that feeds on a variety of things in the tank, including algae, biofilms, protozoans, tiny snails, and copepods, which could explain a lot. In some cases, they may be beneficial. This tank did have a bout with green algae, beat it without human intervention, other than removing it once, and it never came back. Was it microcrustaceans, planaria, or something else? It's one of the only tanks that had an ongoing challenge with cyano. A working theory is the flatworms seem to be fairly indiscriminate eaters and are likely eating the healthy biofilm right off the rock, the microbiome or microcrustaceans that would normally defend against cyanobacteria. Without that healthy microbial layer, the cyano wins out. This is a plausible explanation for why the diatoms eventually show up in the sand, but not in the rock as well. The planaria seem to prefer the rocks versus the sand. If they eat diatoms, it would explain why this is the only tank where the diatoms only showed up as a problem in the sand and not the rocks. This brings up two questions. First, are planaria actually a component of the tank's microscopic cleanup crew, natural microbiome, and micropredators of the uglies that we've been talking about? Well, the answer is no one would intentionally add them to a tank because they can irritate corals, look terrible in the tank. But yes, they are very likely performing an ugly cleanup crew function both in the ocean and the tank. 
However, without any natural predators in the tank, they take over and nothing good happens when one organism overwhelmingly wins the microscopic war to the point that it covers an entire surface. However, if we add a couple wrasses like a yellow chorus or melanalish wrasse, which are commonly effective flatworm predators, but also six lines, mystery, and even potentially mandarins, anything seen hunting the surfaces for small microorganisms all day could have a chance for developing a taste for planaria. Keep the flatworms at bay and manageable. Maybe even a helpful population level or component of a well-balanced, complete, harmonious biome. Like I said though, no one would intentionally add planaria to a tank. They're easier, lower risk paths to the same goal. One of the things that we haven't covered so far is an effective method of coral dips that avoid introductions of these types of pests, but it'll be an important part of the series. However, dips and avoiding introduction of pests like planaria are far from 100% effective. So part of the layers of holistic approach to tank biome is proactively adding predators for an organism that left unchecked can explode in populations and decimate other critical components of the overall tank balanced biome. A complete breadth of utilitarian fish or macro predators is also something that this series will address as well. So the Instatank method works, but success is a gamble. Depends on what comes on the corals and if you have the right balance of macro predators because the micro predators in biofilm have not had a chance to populate yet. The lights in the corals on day one approach in seeding microbiome is also better suited for a lower light LPS tank than an SPS tank or mixed tank. Light intensity changing the odds of the gamble. The coral instatank doesn't fulfill our mission of a consistent, reliable method of avoiding all five uglies the biome series is pursuing. Next up is the dark rubble tank. That's the rubble for my 360 sump that was placed in the sump area, the E170. This might be one of the best, if not the best performances against the pestlery in our experiment. Dark rubble may just turn out to be the nexus of adding much of what worked from the other established tanks and avoiding the rest. We left this tank in week 15 with a couple patches of what looks like cyano and some filamentous algae on the back of the tank. This is where we dosed the ugly slurry. Week 16, some of the filamentous algae grows on the back of the tank, but not on the rock or sand, which houses most of the microbiome and the microcrustaceans. Week 18, the tank catches some dinos from the slurry and they grow into a sheet in the sand, something that we confirmed under the microscope. However, in week 19, it's already weaker and being beat out. This is also the point where most of the tanks had that orange diatom explosion, but not here. Week 20, the gas bubble trapped under what would seem like a dead layer of dinos. Week 21, we cleaned the tank and the rest of it looks pretty good. Most of the tanks actually got worse after cleaning, but two weeks later in week 23, this one stays clean. In fact, if we play it back against week 23 versus 21, it actually got cleaner. Week 25, 10 weeks post ugly slurry. This tank looks clean, natural looking, minimal signs of the ugly slurry. We dosed twice to all the tanks. Before I share more on the dark rubble tank and why it worked, look at week one to week 25. You're going to see a healthy amount of clean weeks, obvious signs of microcrustaceans, signs of green algae that rapidly dissipate on their own, cyano that dissipates on its own. Some pest organisms are in here, but they're just not taking over. After we dose the slurry, dinos show up, but that dissipates on its own as well. This is also one of the four tanks that never had any signs of explosive orange diatoms, even though we dosed them twice and we know they're in there. This is the baseline of microbiome success that we'd like to found a tank on. I believe the most likely reason for why this tank never let any one ugly thrive or take over the tank is there's unseen natural predators for the ugly pests in these tanks. When one organism blooms, its natural predator blooms the week after. Shortly after that, the predator and prey both find a natural balance where they coexist, but at smaller populations and rarely seen. While these tanks got 10% weekly water changes, they were only physically cleaned two times in six months, week nine and 21. Outside of that, pests were never physically removed, no aggressive nutrient control or attempts to starve the pests, no algicides to kill them, no snails, crabs, sand sifters, tanks, no utilitarian fish at all. There were ugly stages with the dark rubble, but this tank is capable of managing them without human intervention because we set the microbiome up for success. These micro predators and protective biofilm, the baseline of the biome redundancy conversation. Now imagine what happens in this tank if we layer in the meso predators, most of us would call the cleanup crew. Small mouths that scrape the surfaces for the beginning of problems and the macro predators or utilitarian fish which hunt down what breaks through that. This is a strong approach to a healthy high percentage reef tank. That brings us to the next tank. The experiment tank started with the rock and sand from the exact same tank as the dark rubble that just performed so well. 
However, in this case, we took the rock and sand from the display of the 360 and put it in the display of the experiment tank. Presumably much of the same microbiome as the dark rubble, but add in all the photosynthetics. It's not as bad as you might expect, but the journey is different. Starting at week 15, other than the hair algae and a patch of cyano, it looks fairly clean. This is where we dose the ugly slurry. Week 16, it's hard to see, but the bubbly type of chrysophyte shows up rapidly from the slurry, the wet indo rock, the donor of that chrysophyte and the ugly slurry. Algae increases in some areas. Week 17 and 18, it's easier to see the chrysophytes. Week 19, we see the most subtle tint change that indicates the orange diatoms from the ugly slurry might come. This is the week that they showed up in most of the tanks, but week 20, it's gone without ever really showing up. The bubble chrysophytes are there, but they're not taking over. Something is keeping them at bay. Week 21, we clean the tank and it looks clean. Week 23, however, some of the uglies come back, just not to the same degree, and it finishes week 25 about in the same place. Not perfect, but far from the worst, and notably, it avoided the diatom explosion. Looking at the entire journey from week one, this tank didn't do quite as well as the dark rubble, primarily because rather than solving its own issues like the dark rubble did, this rock from the same tank was unable to completely solve both the hair algae and the chrysophytes on its own. The fact of the matter is, with a few tangs and snails, this tank probably would have looked good because it did effectively fight off the cyano, diatoms, and dinos from the slurry. This ended as a top performer, but also a bit hard for people to replicate with 100% of rock and sand coming from an established tank. Which is why we lean to the dark rubble, which is easier and cheaper to replicate. Next is the worst of the bunch, 100% of the water from an existing tank. In this case, the BRS-160, which has been up since 2015. This tank just ends up not ready to deal with the uglies, and it shows. Time to see why the established tank water is just not enough. Week 15, the tank is starting with some likely chrysophytes and cyano. We dose the ugly slurry. Week 16, more of the same. Week 17, the chrysophytes are receding and generally the easiest pest to outcompete in our tanks. Week 18, the familiar orange tint shows up. And week 19, there it is. The ugly slurry beat the tank. Week 20, it only gets worse. Week 21, we do our best to clean it up, but it's hard to get all the slime out of the tank. Two weeks later, week 23, not only do the diatoms come back, but they're joined by thick sheets of cyano, which only gets worse in week 25. This issue lasts for months and only beat down the road with two consecutive weeks of red slime remover, which worked, but also a hammer solution for when your redundant biome fails you. The 100% water transfer method, some of the worst eDNA balance scores and visually looks the worst by far. I believe the water just didn't introduce what we needed and couldn't defend against the intentional introductions with the pest slurry. There may be some value from using established water, but not as a standalone approach. You may be seeing a theme here. These tanks that don't show signs of microcrustaceans all end up with the diatom issue. In a moment, I'll share how we find out if pods or microcrustaceans are a solution. We're gonna dose pods of these tanks, but in a way that most probably wouldn't consider. Before that, tank 12, the purple artificial rock from Real Reef, cured in seawater. This is another one that breezed right through the first 15 weeks, looking stellar the entire time. The purple surely hiding some of that. Week 15 looks nearly the same as the day we turned the lights on two and a half months ago. Then we dosed the ugly slurry. Week 16, fine. Week 17, fine. And you guessed it. Week 18, slight change in color. Doesn't look orange because the rock is purple. But then week 19, diatom explosion. No amount of purple will hide this. Week 20, easily one of the worst looking tanks here. We clean it in week 21. It still looks pretty bad. In fact, comparing week 15 and 21, it would appear that the diatoms have actually removed some of the purple color from the rock. In any case, diatoms back with a vengeance two weeks later. And in week 25, no green algae, no cyano, no dinos, no chrysophytes. But to be frank, I'm not even sure they ever had a chance with how fast the diatoms exploded here. Microbiome, microcrustaceans, or just bad luck the cause. I think the moral of the story here is we need to avoid the orange diatom explosions because they seem to outcompete everything. Worse yet, I have a strong suspicion that week 15 to 25 would have been different if we had established a pod population to keep the diatoms at bay. And the good news is we won't have to wonder if that's true because we're gonna do that very thing next. That's phase three. We dose multiple jars of algae barns, ecopods, to each of these tanks, looking for that pound of cure. Will the copepods be capable of building a population that keeps the diatoms in control? If they do, a single jar up front might be that ounce of prevention that avoids them all to begin with. The answer to that question, right here.